Hey, how's it going? I'm your host, Gerhard Zu, and you're listening to Ship It, a podcast about getting your best ideas into the world and seeing what happens. We talk about code, ops, infrastructure, and the people that make it happen. Yes, we focus on the people because everything else is an implementation detail. My first proper serverless experience was in 2019 when I learned with Alan, Damien, Sol, and Wycliffe about AWS CDK, EventBridge, and which remote work principles apply to this specific team. So John Arundel tweeted, Hey John, I forwarded it to Sol, and a few weeks later Wycliffe joined the team. Because Wycliffe is based in Kenya, the entire team had to become remote to make it work. Soon after, the pandemic happened, and the travel industry was hard hit. How did Skyhook Adventure, a business based on adventure trips, make it work? What role did serverless play in this? How did GitHub Actions, a monorepo, and an event-based architecture help? Let's find out. Big thanks to our partners Fastly, LaunchDarkly, and Linode. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com. Feature flags powered by launchdarkly.com. And we love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com forward slash changelog. This episode of Ship It is brought to you by Render, the zero DevOps cloud that empowers you to ship faster than your competitors. Here's Anurag Goel, CEO of Render, sharing why developers choose Render over Heroku and how they're innovating much faster. A lot of Render customers come to us from Heroku and they tell us Render is what Heroku could have been. I think it's because we offer a more streamlined approach to hosting modern cloud applications at a significantly better price point. Applications on Render heal themselves and scale automatically, giving developers the features and flexibility of something like Kubernetes, but without any of the complexity. We're always working to bring the latest industry advances to our platform. So your applications can leverage the state of the art in the cloud without you having to do or learn anything. All right, learn more about how Render compares to Heroku at render.com slash compare or email changelog at render.com for a personal intro and to ask questions about the Render platform. Again, that's render.com slash compare or email changelog at render.com. We are going to ship in three, two, one. So in 2019, we spent a bit of time together. I found out about this new startup, which was doing some interesting things with serverless. And uh, we worked together for some number of weeks. It was basically a day in a week for some number of weeks. And that was a great experience. I really enjoyed myself. I met these wonderful people, Alan, Saul, Wycliffe, and Damien. And it was a great experience overall. And now, Alan, Sol, and Wycliffe are joining me today to talk about what has happened since, because we've been out of touch since 2019. So between 2019 and today, what happened? Good question. <laughs> Obviously, the big thing is there's been a pandemic. Right. And essentially, for your listeners, Skyek is a travel website. It's a website where you can book adventure holidays. So. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this has impacted us quite quite hard, and it's been a it's been a challenge to get through that. But at the same time, we've taken this big opportunity to really rethink how we're doing things and really improve our product, so yeah. that we can come out of this. Uh, and we are starting to come out of this now with a much much better product for customers. So, Skyhook Adventure, what does it do as a company? So, essentially, at its heart, Sky is basically a website where you can book adventure trips like uh, hiking to Everest Base Camp, really unique trips, or um, canoeing all the way across Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, and when you do that, you're actually booking with a local guide. So, not a big company, typically a sort of a one man operation. And we find that gives you like a really, really unique, authentic experience. So, that's kind of it from the guest side or customer side in a way. Mm -hmm. But we're also on the other side, we're a, a business product as well. We're a place where the guides can 
manage their trips and do all this kind of admin that you'd usually do with your trip that can take a few hours a day and mm -hmm. just automate most of that away. So from that, what you've just said, how did we end up with serverless? Because that's what's happening in the back end, right? What's the link between these adventures? <laughs> yeah. Do you have to be adventurous, really adventurous to choose serverless? <laughs> that's definitely true. <laughs> it's probably one for Sul. Sul's the one who really introduced us first to serverless. Yeah, so it's a really good question, that Gerhard. I think it probably goes back to when Alan got me along. So I initially got got invited along to Skyhook to help out on the payments. So payments was causing quite a challenge. Payments in the travel world is quite a complex area. It's not as straightforward as your average e-commerce business. There's lots of rules and regulations that need to be complied with. And it, it's quite a specialized field of, of payments. And I'd got a bit of experience in the payments world before that. So Alan got in touch and said, hey, can you come along and see what we could perhaps do? So I spent a bit of time going, going through that with Alan, and we did come up with a solution at the end. It's still in place to this day. It's not all perfect, but it gets the job done for us for now. But what I said to Alan, and we were using a Drupal system at the time, so the, this marketplace, the Skyhook marketplace, was based on Drupal. And I said, hey, Alan, have you thought about using some different tech to do this? You know, there's lots of things out there. There's containers and this new thing called serverless. And I think where I was coming at it from is I was envisaging this travel business as I was thinking of it almost like a a travel magazine where it was made up of multiple parts. So one part would be the trips that you browse and you look at. And I could sort of envisage that as almost like a static website with content not changing particularly much over time. And then all these other constituent parts, so the payments, the booking side, accounting, and all of those kind of aspects as being very discrete, specific tasks that nicely suited this serverless paradigm where you would just create these Lambda functions or whatever it may be that you choose and you set and forget and you allow all of these discrete tasks to be handled uh, very specifically. And that's how we then obviously joined the team and uh, slightly later on, and we went down this track of diving into the serverless world and, and created the first iteration of uh, the new Skyhook platform, which was a, a serverless monolith, really, of, of, of sorts, based on AWS and we're using RDS as the database. And we've then gone on from that journey from there, really. Right. So even though you had all these Lambda functions, that's what serverless means to you. That's what, actually what it translates to, right? Lambda functions running on AWS. They were all backed by the same RDS database. Is that right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So we were, we were using uh, AWS's Aurora database initially. It took us quite a while mm -hmm. to, to design it. And, uh, and it was quite a, you had to zoom out to see the whole thing, which was a, a, an interesting experience the further we got. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly right. That's how we started. So who, who can tell us a bit more about that, like that zooming out part, how that happened and what did you discover as you started zooming out? It's funny because Saul actually had at one point a printed out version of our database schema mm -hmm. and okay. the thing was huge. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'd obviously worked with SQL databases quite a lot in the past and that was where my experience lay at the time. You know, there were conversations when setting out, what route do we go down here? Do we start looking at some of the more serverless centric databases here, some of the NoSQL databases that are available that fit the serverless paradigm nicely? Or do we stick with what we know? And at the time, the decision was to stick with what we knew. Uh, after, after much consideration, you know, you're, you're learning so much uh, at this time, at an early stage of going into a, a new bleeding edge, edge technology or something that's new to you, that there's this constant trade-off between picking new tools and actually getting stuff done and shipping it. And it seemed at the time that, that going down the route of choosing Dynamo, which would have been the obvious choice given that we had elected to use the AWS platform, it seemed like there was quite a steep learning curve to that and a lot of room for error. And we could have got ourselves into a bit of a hole that was tricky to, to get out of. 
So we didn't go for that initially, and we dove headfirst into uh, Amazon Aurora, which was quite young at the time, quite evolving quite rapidly, but still quite young and missing some of the basic features and functionality that actually would have been quite nice to have. So we continued down that route for, for some time. The database grew and the zooming out got further and further back. And we started to run into challenges, you know, database migrations and updating and changing and the schema lock-in that we had all started to, you know, it was something that worked for us and it worked for a long time, but we did start to find that there were challenges there. And we then started to look at other opportunities out there and think, hey, should we be using something that's more purpose-built for this? And did you? Yeah, we, we, we yep. did in the end. <laughs> this was the beginning, right? Aurora, all those challenges, SQL base, single database, uh, migrations were challenging, a couple of other things. So this was like, what, two years ago, three years ago? Mm-hmm. Two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. So what does today look like from a database perspective? It's super interesting. So we've actually moved to using, so it's really splitting up our services. So like Saul mentioned, we have a service for managing displaying trips we have a completely mm-hmm. separate one for managing bookings, another one for accounting. And actually, each one has its own database, which is almost entirely DynamoDB. For listeners who are not aware of it, it's very similar to MongoDB mm-hmm. or other document-based databases. And at the same time, we've moved from having a REST API, which all these sort of serverless functions interacted with, to using GraphQL. Interesting. AppSync in particular, which is sort of managed GraphQL as a service. Mm-hmm. Both the API and the data layer have changed, but a lot of the underlying logic is pretty similar and is often just kept the same, just with more testing and things like that. So what is better about the new setup? I can give you the business side, and it'll be interesting to hear as well on the technical side. But from a business side, it's way more reliable. So, mm-hmm. And you know, you have these problems as a startup, but to give you the example of, of a host adding their trip. So the guest or customer experience of booking a trip has always been quite smooth. But in terms of adding trips and editing trips, it's been very clunky and very bug prone. So we'd see multiple tech uh, support tickets every day. If you gave a demo, there was a good chance it would break to a host. It's obviously quite embarrassing. And that's basically gone away. So the system is a lot more reliable today than it was two years ago. Yes, and that's transposed into other metrics like many more host signups, many more trips on the website just from having this much more robust uh, and easier to use set of tools. What about developing with a new setup? What is it like writing code for the new setup versus the old setup? Yeah, because most of the time you are like dealing that with a very specific service that is a very uh, like trips to be able to, for instance, it's always easy or easier to sort of keep focus, easier to deploy and easier mm-hmm. to know when you, when you have that separation of concerns, you're able to know when you are breaking something or not break something, that is your code is very specific. Another thing that has helped us a lot is uh, tests, which we have increased mm-hmm. the number of tests we have. So we have like uh, a lot of unit tests. Uh, we have always been having a debate about whether to go for the hard percent test coverage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we are looking to like sort of like bring in some integration tests in there and some end-to-end tests for that is for the website. But in all, all in all, the scope of the task we are doing that is like, for instance, over the first, last few months, we have been migrating a few services. And because you're working on a very specific area and it's a Lambda function, it's a little bit easier to work, work through it, and be able to test it and end up with a more reliable service in general. That makes a lot of sense. So rather than changing part of this big hole, now I have like discrete units that you can focus your last area, so to speak. So if there is a failure or a problem, it's limited to that specific service. Yeah. So did this change the deploy times, basically how quickly the code goes into production? Yeah, this has the effect of that. The deploy times are like, uh, like uh, mostly at uh, three minutes. The tests three are also, minutes? Yeah. Tests wow. are also faster. And uh, it's always easier to get feedback when you're doing deployment. You can even say like, I won't even have like a local version running. I'll just push it to the CD and see what's, uh, what's it, it's like on the staging service. Mm-hmm. That's uh, the one amazing thing because uh, having dealt with the old system, uh, because I joined somewhere in the middle, it was always like uh, difficult to get that quick feedback cycle. 
also it took very long to deploy the whole service because you have to deploy everything together. How long did it used to take? About 20 minutes, I'm not sure. <laughs> 20 minutes, wow. And you think that's too long? <laughs> Some people would say like <laughs> two hours is too long. So it's really interesting that you think 20 minutes is too long, which again, for some would be perfectly okay. So 20 minutes was too long, and now three minutes is just about right, would you say, right? I would probably say I would like it to be a little bit faster. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah. The faster I can see the results of what I'm working on, the better. Speed is addictive, right? And first of all, as you mentioned, very important. The quicker you can understand your mistake in production, the quicker you can fix it. And if you can do it so quickly that people don't even notice it, isn't that the best? Yeah, that's even better. Amazing. So uh, back to you, Sol. From an architecture perspective, how many services do you have? Do they interact amongst themselves? Do they share anything? What does that look like? That's a really good question. Gosh, I don't, I don't know what they were at the last count. We seem to add about one a week as we move over. And as Wycliffe says, we've been doing a lot of this migration. So we keep the services very specific to tasks. So, you know, we have reviews related services that handle everything to do with customer reviews and bookings related services. So Probably, you know, you could count our, our number of services on your hands at the moment. But, you know, we anticipate that growing over time. And, and this new architecture allows us to very quickly add new services, test them. And like you're just saying, you know, you get to that point of failure uh, and find where your failure is much more quickly. And you can then iterate, correct and get out what the customer actually wants. And I think that's actually an interesting area. So these feedback loops is something that when you came along, Gerhard, I remember sitting down with you and you said, we've got to get this DevOps cycle going and get these feedback loops going really rapidly so that you can learn from what you, you put out there and feed that back into what you're working on. That sticks in the back of my mind all the time, really. And we're constantly thinking, how can we how can we get these feedback loops going faster and faster? And this new microservices-based architecture really has helped us with that. Uh, and we're shipping, you know, at a, a much, much higher velocity than we were previously. Another thing we're starting to try as well is including things like feature flags. Instead of, uh, you know, pushing out large chunks of code, we'll every day push out multiple new features and just flag them off and show them to specific sets of customers or ourselves internally. We'll test those. And all of these sort of architectural choices actually do have very direct impact on, on the customer, on how rapidly features reach them, on how rapidly we can improve those features and learn what, what the customer wants. So I think it, it's definitely something that I put a lot of thought into. And, and as a team, we put a lot of thought into that as well. This episode is brought to you by our friends at LaunchDarkly. Feature management for the modern enterprise. Power testing in production at any scale. Here's how it works. LaunchDarkly enables development teams and operation teams to deploy code at any time, even if a feature isn't ready to release to users. Wrapping code with feature flags gives you the safety to test new features and infrastructure in your production environments without impacting the wrong end users. When you're ready to release more widely, update the flag status and the changes are made instantaneously by the real time streaming architecture. Eliminate risk, deliver value, get started for free today at launchdarkly.com. Again, launchdarkly.com. I would like to go back, Sol, to how the those microservices talk amongst themselves. So first of all, my understanding is that those microservices are just collections of serverless functions that get deployed as one unit. So it's just a grouping of serverless functions. They all have their own data store, which is DynamoDB. And what I'm wondering is how do they talk amongst themselves? Or do they even talk among, I mean, is there any need to communicate between services? I wish there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be perfect if there was no network latency, <laughs> nothing failed out there? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, this is something that's an evolving area for us. There's lots of solutions that people tout out there, you know, people using gRPC to communicate 
between microservices. I mean, we're using AWS AppSync, and what we have is we have a separate API service, and that API service allows us to expose the AppSync service to each service, so everyone can use the API to query for whatever data it wants. We're still at the early stages of running with this and using it, but at the moment it is working really very well for us on for the most part. I don't know if Alan want, wants to add anything to that because it's it's an area where Alan's really pioneered a lot of that. Yes, yeah, so that's for synchronous communication specifically, which is actually quite a small part of total communication between services. And it's quite quite an unusual setup actually in that mm -hmm. the services are going back to AppSync because often you, you, for example, you have a mutation to create a booking and then the booking service will go back to AppSync, the, basically to the API and say, how much availability does this particular date have? I.e., can we make the booking or is it already fully booked? But the majority of communication happens asynchronously via AWS EventBridge which is, we ended up trying a lot of different services for this, but AWS EventBridge has gained loads of traction recently in serverless communities because it's great. It's the, it's the short answer. So for example, the booking service, when you make a booking, that will put some events onto this sort of central event bus. And then the trip service will listen to that and say, there's a new booking, let's reduce the number of spaces. And all of that happens in a few seconds, but it's asynchronous, so we don't have to worry about any problems with the services communicating and causing latency and all the rest. Okay. What sorts of messages do the services put on the event bridge? A lot. Is the are they, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, but are they JSON? Do you have like a specific protocol? Do you have any versioning? Uh, like, how do they know how to read those events? Do you have any schemas? How does that look like? Sure. It actually uses the same schema as our API, which makes things very simple. So the booking object on our API is the same as the booking object as a JSON object that's put on the event bus um, alongside a standard name. So booking create, booking update, something like that. Okay, so event bus, not event bridge. Uh, event bridge, which is an event bus, sorry. Yeah. I see. Okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. So in terms of number of transactions, volume, latency, anything like that. Can you give us some numbers? What looks like, I know, a good latency? Do you have such a thing? Do you have any SLOs, any SLIs, anything around how well the service services interact? Uh, definitely, I think we could get better at this, is the, is the mm -hmm. short answer. Most queries respond within 10 milliseconds. So mm -hmm. very, very snap. From, for a web app perspective, that's very fast. And that hasn't really caused us any issues at the moment. And that's internal, right? So like the services, when they talk amongst themselves, they can expect the synchronous mm -hmm. responses to come back within 10 milliseconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what about the public world? Do you have, um, I know, CloudFront? What's it's in front of the API? This is probably one for Weeklyph, but basically Next.js sits on the front of it. But maybe Weeklyph, you could explain a bit about that. For the front end, we are basically using Next.js, which is um, based on the app, for those who don't know about that. So most of our important pages, that is the trips pages, the home page, uh, individual trips, hosts, and so on, are SSL. So Next.js sort of like uh, goes to the API, fetches the data, and then uh, sets in a full SSL page or a static page to the front end. Where it does some dehydration so that the page uh, gets the data and can behave more like a, a single page application rather than a static application, which, uh, which is normally what you don't want when you want to be able to, uh, to provide a rich user experience for the user. So essentially what, that, what this involves is uh, the fetching between Next.js that is on, uh, so our application is uh, hosted on Vaso, which is the parent company of Next.js, or the ones, the company that builds Next.js and open, open sources it. So essentially what that goes directly to AppSync. At the moment, we don't really have any caching but that might be an option for the future. So AppSync directly goes to the individual services to get the requested data, and then it does that for to Next.js, which uh, sort of like caches some pages that uh, don't change that frequently so that the users get uh, uh, some, some pages much faster than it would involve getting it directly to uh, AppSync every time you, you send a request. That makes sense. So Next.js, 
I imagine that is a JavaScript framework, right? Based on React, mm -hmm. that's my understanding. So how do you serve that to a user? So if a user goes, for example, to skyhookadventure.com, I imagine they load this Next.js-based response. Yeah. Where does that get served from? That's based on Vaso. Vaso.com, I think, is their website, which basically is mm -hmm. like Netlify. It's built on top of AWS as well, and it uses uh, Lambda under the hood. So basically, each page we have is a Lambda function, but Next.js sort of abstracts that away from us. So I still in my head, I I'm not understanding mm -hmm. this. So a request comes in, the DNS, what does the DNS for skyhookadventure.com point to? It uh, points to Vaso servers. Vaso, I've never heard of them. I will need to put them in show notes because I've never heard of them. Okay. And they are similar to Netlify, right? They are much similar to Netlify. In fact, they have a lot of similarities. Netlify is the more mature of the services, but Net, uh, Vaso has like a zero config option, which means you give them a, an application, whether it's Next.js or any other framework, and you can get it up mm -hmm. running without having to configure anything. Interesting. And how do you give them this application? They have like a GitHub application. Sort mm -hmm. of like you connect your repository to their servers and they determine which sort of application it is and, uh, mm -hmm. and sort of like uh, de determine the configuration required to run that environment on their servers. Right. That's really interesting. Of course, we are using a custom deployment environment because uh, we need to pass in some environment variables from, uh, from AWS, which means mm -hmm. we have our own custom CICD environment to deploy that. Okay, and where does the CI CD run? What is CI CD in your case? In our case, we basically use uh, GitHub Actions. Mm -hmm. The first uh, step is usually to get the secrets from uh, AWS, that is SSM mostly. And mm -hmm. these are not basically secrets, but other configuration environments that are required to configure the environment, like the URL of the API, mm -hmm. apps in API, and then passes that over to uh, VAS so that it can run the build. That sounds really interesting. Okay, again, I've never heard of the service. I definitely want to check it out. Why did you choose? I think you said why you chose it because Netlify would just requires more configuration, right? That was my understanding. Yeah, and with Netlify, you have to do a lot of configuration for different environments. It still has improved over mm -hmm. the last few years, but the zero config, and then also you, you factor in that uh, Vaso is the parent company for Next.js, so they, it's their own product that is. So it becomes a, a very good uh, combination. I see. That makes sense. Okay, that makes that makes sense. And do you have multiple environments? Do you have like staging or per feature environments, or is there just like a single production? And that's the beauty of like uh, using Vaso. So another advantage is that each PR you have gets its own like uh, unique URL. So. If right. multiple people build like uh, different uh, sides of the website, they get their own preview URL, which they can work on without having to end up to interfere with each other. That sounds really interesting. And I really like that idea. I know Netlify does something similar, but I never understood for a stateful service, great, you have a feature yeah. environment, but what about the data? How do you do the data migration for that? How do you solve that problem? We would love to have one complete backend built per PR as well, which is mm. close to being feasible in the serverless world because it costs pennies to run. And then really per PR, you could have all your own test data, your own environment. Um, but we don't have that. It's, it doesn't seem to be mm -hmm. at least easy with AWS. So we have this great feature on the front end where it's all built per PR, but it goes to right. one staging backend, which has a set amount of test data. I see. Okay, and then I imagine that GitHub Actions does any migration that it needs to do on the staging environment so that the PR, is that right? Or do you have like per PR, like how does GitHub Action basically know, how does GitHub Actions know what to do on the staging environment based on the type of push or whatever action it is? It's basically configured in a GitHub Action file, a workflow file, per mm. microservice, or there's a separate one for the, the website, the front end. And that defines right. a series of steps that it goes through specifically for that service or the website. That makes sense. So I'm imagining that you have different repositories per microservice. Is that right? Mm, no. We have a single no? repository for all our services. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said something right. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm a big fan of single repository. Why? Because it keeps everything simple. Now, I know that's something that we discussed in 2019. Yeah. How well did it actually work in practice with all these changes? I'm so curious to hear about this. This has been a super pivotal thing in terms of leverage that you yourself have had on the company, Gerhard, in terms of saying, let's both let's split it up into microservices, but also at the same time, let's bring everything into one repo on GitHub. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is, for example, yesterday I pushed something which actually impacted every service. And you just mm -hmm. see a list of 30, 40 ticks as the different CD pipelines are running in parallel. Mm -hmm. And then you can push it up with a huge amount of confidence without wow. worrying about synchronizing everything. I'm getting so warm and fuzzy right now. It's <laughs> not the weather. I can tell you that. This feels great. I think this is the best feedback I received all week, all month. I don't know. This was like amazing. Okay. Wow. It makes me so happy. I have no idea. Great. I'm wondering now, Weekliff, what does a merge into the main branch look like? Like what happens between merging into main and the code appearing in production? Can you run us through that? You have three minutes because that's how long it takes, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll probably do go over that. <laughs> anyway, for once you merge that, uh, that's a match commit. Uh, so most of, mostly we squash our commits. So it's going to be a single commit. And the first thing it does is uh, run a few tests. That is unit tests. And uh, once that's done, so that means uh, uh, also running the LinkedIn and also trying mm -hmm. to build it so that we can catch all errors that are build related, LinkedIn errors and test related before. The reason we do this is sometimes mm -hmm. something that uh, happened uh, on a PR uh, and the test pass might not, uh, the conditions might not be duplicated on uh, production. So you need to be sure mm -hmm. that uh, all the tests are passing. Then after that is we attempt to deploy again to staging. And the reason we do this is because sometimes we run integration tests against uh, staging, which is a step that comes after the, uh, the point to staging. And once, uh, if there is any test that to be run uh, on the staging environment, that is the integration test, uh, we are, then the deployment to master takes place, that is the deployment to production. So all in all, depending on the mm -hmm. amount of tests taken uh, and, and the size of the code base, that may take anywhere to between one to three minutes. Uh, on our new smaller services, it's even faster than that. Do you find yourself pushing changes at the same time to multiple services? Like what, Alan, you mentioned yesterday that you made the change. What does that look like? I'm wondering, Alan. Yeah, I don't do it that often to that many services, for sure. That was actually a change for billing tagging in AWS. But basically how it works is, for example, you want to update the website and your backend service. You can push those through at the same time, especially if the website feature is feature flagged or not available to users yet. You can push them mm -hmm. at the same time, and that lets you encapsulate maybe a small piece of code but spread across several areas mm -hmm. and uh, see the change very quickly. There's actually quite another cool feature here, which is that we use GitHub Actions, which means we can have very specific tests for specific services. So mm -hmm. Saul mentioned our API service, which is basically just has a GraphQL schema, and that checks for breaking changes to the schema on every push, which is you know obviously super important if you don't want to have to version your schema. And uh, the accounting service spins up Puppeteer to run some tests, a very specific tests on our payments provider. That's interesting. Okay, so you have all these tests, all these services. How do you, how do you configure them? Like, how do you set everything up in the first place? Because there's quite a bit of things, right? Like GitHub Actions mm -hmm. on AWS, you have all those services. How do you set everything up? What do you use for that? So before CDK, there's there's Hygen that we use. So in order, when we first build a new service, what we'll do is we'll, we'll code gen it using a tool called Hygen. And that sets up mm -hmm. the basic template of each service. So the core things that we require in a service um, will, be, will be there, will be ready to use, and will be standardized across them. So anything that needs to be defaulted. And that's actually proven extremely useful for allowing us to go away maybe individually and create a new service that you can then pass on to another team member who will have an idea of what the service should contain. You can dive in and and understand it at a high level very, very quickly. Okay, yeah. where do you store all this config? Hygiene is very interesting, isn't it? In that it actually stores the config in your repo next to where it's being used. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So that makes it super easy to edit because obviously, so it contains things like testing and linting setups. So we can mm -hmm. go in there and add something in very easily if we want to change how it's done for future services. Okay. Uh, so it's committed up essentially. Okay, that's great. It's version controlled. I love the sound of that. Mm -hmm. How does it get applied? How do all those changes get rolled out onto AWS? When we were working together a couple of years ago, Gerhard, we were using um, CloudFormation. Yep, I remember that. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things you said, which is obvious in hindsight, is I really hate YAML, especially yep. when it's 500 lines long for a service. Mm. And of course, our services, they're mostly not actually Lambda code. They're things like SQS, simple queue service queues, and lots of built-in AWS products to remove the amount of work we have to do. So we now deploy that using AWS CDK, which lets us write infrastructure and TypeScript. Mm -hmm. And it also means that we can create separate uh, node modules uh, that basically have some pre-built defaults in them. So mm -hmm. if you want to stream from DynamoDB to EventBridge, so take your data and stream it to the event bus, you can add in three lines of code, uh, basically a custom CDK construct that we've added that behind the scenes creates a Lambda function and queues and dead letter queues and alarms if it fails, all this complexity. But it's just three lines of code that says, you know what, I want this Dynamo DB table to stream to my event bus. Okay, that sounds like a very good setup, I have to say. And I also would like to add that my relationship with YAML went through different cycles. It's a <laughs> definitely love-hate sort of thing. Yeah. I have to say that. But I think my biggest distaste from abusing YAML came from seeing it being used in cloud formation, where it literally do increment like an INC. Can you imagine the string INC put in a list? And then you had two numbers which had to be incremented. A variable would be generated out of that. So basically, you'd program in YAML, which I think was abhorrent. You should never do that. I remember that moment, <laughs> and I think I will remember it till the end of my days. So that was like horrible. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. If you want to do that, then just use a programming language, right? Like TypeScript. That <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I remember that moment. So I'm really glad that you went down this path because if you do have to do that, do any sort of templating, any sort of like, you know, smart logic, don't do it in YAML, please. It's just horrible. So yeah, I mean, I'm very glad that that works so well as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, that's okay. that's had a big impact on us. One of the most depressing things is changing a small piece of cloud formation and then waiting 15 minutes for it to tell you that there's something wrong in the cloud formation. That's right. I remember that. That was painful. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're in a much better place now. And with that in mind, I know that things can always improve. It's one of my favorite things about this specifically. It's easy to improve and the whole industry keeps improving all the time. So what I'm wondering now is what could be better about your current setup? Do you have some improvements in mind that you would like to do? We're constantly looking for improvements. You know, we're, we're working with what I think a lot of people would consider as, as bleeding edge technology. And that means that some of the decisions that we make don't always pan out to be the best ones. You know, it can take trying trying them out to to actually realize that it isn't the best tool for the job for us. That was something we talked about previously. We went down the route of using RDS as a single database store and and found that actually it made more sense to go down uh, the, the the Dynamo route. And what we're always constantly sort of struggling against though is this how we use our time. So we can seek to change things like we are currently. We're doing a number of migrations of old services. But what that means is well, we reduce the amount of business value that we ship. So there's this, this push and pull constraint that we're, that we're working against with uh, what, the, what may be best for the dev side and what we want to work on, what we want to chop out, change, improve, go back and fix versus what we need to ship to customers to improve their lives and to release more business value and grow the company. I think on the, you know, to, to answer your question, I think an area for me that is so important is, is development. The development experience is something where we still need to make quite a few improvements. You mentioned the, your questions about how our data is set up and whether we refresh our data and things in our, our staging environment. And you know, we need to improve that so that the development experience is more fluid and, and more true to what we then push out to production. I know Wycliffe's got a few thoughts around this, so maybe you can jump in there, Wycliffe. 
I think also is uh, also is talking about is more of like uh, uh, environment portability. So being able mm-hmm. to sort of like create a whole bucket for a peer and being able to tear it down once the peer is done. One of the biggest challenges we have mostly when we're working is if we're working on the same service and we end up having like uh, two or more different PRs is when one person deploys, it retires the changes of the other one. So this can become a frustrating point when, whenever you're doing that. So we are looking into sort of like technologies to help us uh, or solutions to help us into that area so that we are able to sort of like work independent of each other. And as the team grows, we'll be able to, we'll be even having that collision a little bit, a little bit more as different teams work on different solutions for different areas. I think that makes a lot of sense. Being able to experiment with data, being able to do things at maybe a larger scale, production scale, like how does this impact production without taking production down? That would be nice, right? Especially if you have to do migrations or big changes. So if anyone is listening to this that has an idea of how to do this better, if someone knows within AWS that are solving this problem or thinking about it, I'm sure that Alan, Wycliffe and Sol would love to hear from you. So don't be shy. We're all friendly, all of us. What's up, shippers? This episode is brought to you by Sentry. You already know working code means happy customers, and that's exactly why teams choose Sentry. From error tracking to performance monitoring, Sentry helps teams see what actually matters, resolve problems quicker, and learn continuously about their applications from the front end to the back end. Over a million developers and 70,000 organizations already ship better software faster with Sentry. That includes us. And guess what? You can too. Ship it listeners new to Sentry get the team plan for free for three months. Use the code SHIPIT when you sign up. Head to Sentry.io and use the code SHIPIT. Is there any particular incident or war story that you would like to share? Something that you've learned from? It doesn't have to be tech related. It can be business related, but something that obviously impacted your users. Because at the end of the day, everything that we do, whether it's coding, shipping, has an impact on our users. And when we get things wrong, they are the ones that suffer the most. So it doesn't always have to be code changes or migration. Sometimes it can be providers that you depend on that fail you and in turn, you fail your users. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of having a think through this. And obviously, you know, we, we as a young team, we come across a lot of challenges on a daily basis. I think perhaps an area that's been particularly challenging for us over the last year to 18 months has been payments, actually. What I originally joined to uh, help out with, we went down the route of choosing our, our payments provider. And obviously, this global pandemic suddenly hit in uh, at the early stages of 2020. And in the travel industry, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of these rules and regulations that you need to follow uh, to, to take payments for future holidays. It, it creates a lot of intricacies when you're taking these future payments. You've got chargeback mechanisms and things and section 75 that comes into play and it instantly travel instantly becomes what's termed a high risk industry to from the card providers and the merchant banks perspectives and we certainly came across an early incident where our payment provider disabled refunds for us unbeknown to us and of course in the early stages of a pandemic occurring there's all manner of changes to bookings going on, customers no longer able to travel. And that was something that had really a very significant impact on us from an operational perspective. Suddenly, the tasks that we were working on one day had to be immediately shelved and the immediate issue jumped upon. Because at the end of the day, we have, you know, you've got to look after your customers. I'm a, a strong believer in customer experience. As, as you know, Gerhard, there's a great book out there, shout mm-hmm. out to uh, Joseph Pine and James Gilmore on the experience economy. Great book, have a read. So, you know, at the end of the day, the experience comes first from our perspective for customers. So we jumped on this and tackled it in our own way and, and patched the holes as best we could. 
But I think it was quite a realization for us that rolling with single providers for third party services definitely it's an obvious thing, but it comes with a, a lot of risk. And when it's a core service, such as payments, it's something where you really need to think about what your options are in, in the worst case scenario. It's something we're still working on. We've talked a lot about it, actually, since that occurrence. And we've got a lot of ideas of how we can fix it. You know, there's tools out there like uh, some of your listeners might have heard of things like Spreedly, where you're able to hook in with... Mm -hmm multiple payment providers rather than running a single provider like Stripe or whoever it might be, you can maybe have two or, or more different providers that get selected uh, depending on various criteria that you can define or, or allow Spreely to define. But you know they are a potential solution, but again, all the complexities in the specific travel world add another layer to solving that challenge. So it's a, it's a really interesting one. And I expect something a lot of people are experiencing right now. That's a really good one because it makes you realize how even in the tech industry, where it's all about code and shipping, you hit against business realities and uh, like payments, yep. right? Like real money has to flow somehow. Well, real, it's mostly virtual these days, but still money has to travel somehow and you start integrating with all these providers. So never mind, it's just your technology partners or providers. It's also the payment providers. Yeah. And for you that have to deal with trips, it's the trip agencies, I imagine, the travel agencies, right, that you have to deal with as well. How are they like for you? We deal with local guides rather than agencies. They're very small companies. So to take a step back, the way it works for payments on our website is you make a payment and actually gets protected in usually a trust fund. That's where mm -hmm. the complexity comes from. So you can't just go through Stripe and send it on with like Stripe Marketplace straight to the provider. It gets protected until after the trip. Mm -hmm. So there was actually, from this perspective, there was not really any risk as far as we were concerned in that all this money can simply be returned if a trip can't go ahead. It just so happened that at the time, our travel payments provider and indeed several others as well, prevented all automatic refunds across their API for all customers. So we were hit with this really challenging problem. How did you solve it? Yeah, uh, it was actually a business solution. In the okay. end, we managed to convince our provider that we were a special case, that we were very safe, and they re-enabled at that time automatic refunds for us. So uh, it took a few weeks to solve, which was obviously very stressful, and we were really concerned for our customers who are nervous and they want to see if they need a refund, they want to see that quickly. So they don't worry about sort of the financial stability of the companies involved. But that was the solution in that case. We actually had a very related incident a while later where, again, we had an, a system issue with payments. And we ended up solving it with a very uh, interesting and unorthodox <laughs> approach where we listened. I like where this is going. Yeah, where we, it, was, it was really useful actually having this event system because... Basically, what happened was refunds had been uh, had shown and succeeded and failed in various ways. And so we replayed our event stream, this time hooked up to a Lambda function, which sent an email to the support team of our payments provider to resolve the issue and triggered a to-do task for us to check that it had been resolved. That's very clever. <laughs> a bit of a complex solution, but you have to think outside the box with these. So much credit to the team for creating that. That is really genius, right? Because statements are facts. Those things happen. Yep. And what you do about those things can change. And having the ability to replay and take a different course of action for things that happened mm -hmm. is so powerful. Wow. So tech solves this specific problem. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And obviously bright minds. <laughs> it's not all tech. <laughs> okay. So we talked about this particular incident, this particular tricky situation, a company fighting for their customers. Mm -hmm. I wish that was the case more often. And I know that many companies do the right thing, but I also know companies that don't do the right thing. So this is admirable. And especially when uh, travel, the travel restrictions hit, I know that a lot of people were affected in many, many ways. So it's great to have a peek behind the scenes as to what it looked like and, you know, companies fighting for their customers, but you know, the payment providers, the, it wasn't trust funds. How, what did you, how did you call them, Alan? No, exactly. The, it's trust funds plus reinsurance usually. Those, you know, having like those relationships coming into play and you having to lean on those and eventually the right thing happening weeks after the fact. There is a lot that goes in the background. And in that point, 
does it matter to ship code? Does it matter to add new features? Not really, no. right? Because the most important thing is doing it right by your customers. And I think many sometimes can get carried away in this world of tech and forget about that critical, critical aspect. Okay, so still thinking about our customers or, or like our, your customers, the Skyhook Adventure customers, which feature that you've shipped in the last six months made you most proud, most happy? And you can go around, maybe you have different favorite features. Wycliffe, how about we start with you? Do you have a specific favorite feature? It doesn't have to be customer facing, but it would be nice if it was. I'd probably say like uh, host sign up. Uh, I sort of consider that my baby. <laughs> Actually, uh, for a long time, made a lot of mistakes in the process <laughs> and learned a lot over the last few months. And I think I rolled out, uh, we pushed it production fully in March. If I'm not mistaken, actually yesterday is when Aaron was telling me I should proud of, be proud of this. We have seen a, a, an, an increase in host signups. Uh, how, how did it work before, before this feature was developed? How did hosts sign, get signed up? The whole process uh, which we, is that we are moving over to a new service. So we sort of like uh, peeled, over, uh, peeled off in that uh, each of us took an individual task. Uh, so I, I focus on the host. I think Aaron was working on the booking service. Essentially, the idea was to improve reliability so that uh, the, the process of signing up was to be much smoother. So we, we sort of like have like uh, an approach where we guide the host through the process of like explaining them, them, to them what it entails. And then mm-hmm. sort of like signing them up so that is so that they can have account and then creating a host profile and then going on to our trips. Mm-hmm. So before it wasn't as reliable as it is right now, we also did some improvement on the UI. I also requested a lot of information upfront before I think was being sent over a spreadsheet or something. I think it's important to emphasize that that previously the hosts filled in PDFs and wow. and a spreadsheet. You know, these are very MVP things. So it's not yes. just when we say migration, okay, there was some migration involved, but actually it was a changing an MVP into a brilliant experience for the hosts. And, you know, we've that seen sounds a, right. We've seen a fivefold well, improvement in the number of hosts signing up, so that's something to be proud of mm-hmm. as well. For sure, for sure. It just goes to show, like, there's many areas like that that you can always improve. Mm-hmm. Knowing which one to focus on, which is the most important one, that's where the business comes into play. And they say, you know what, this is what we need because the company will be able to do these things if we do this thing first. Uh, this is the most important thing because I need to unlock other things. So that is a very nice business working well with tech and working well with maybe marketing. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, even though you're four people, all of you wear different hats. I know that. And you're all ha- all hands-on. And that's one of my favorite things about startups, right? It's like everybody gets to do everything and grow in different ways that they never experienced. So how about you, Alan? Which is your favorite feature? You know, this is kind of a strange one, but uh, cancellations. You know, it's, it's a bit different with the COVID pandemic, but they want to cancel uh, or change dates or do something like that. And previously they had to reach out to us. We'd get back to them within 24 hours. Maybe they'd have some questions about availability, how they can do everything. And actually this is something that happens the whole time. Customers want to switch dates, for example. And now they can just do that straight. They go onto the website, click on their booking, they can click cancel. They see all the details about what's going to happen. They can choose the appropriate option to change dates or get a refund or whatever they need. It's just a colossally better customer experience. That's amazing. So let me guess, is there a cancellation service now? <laughs> it's actually in the booking service. That one is quite big, Right. I have to confess. The bathing mm-hmm. code is pretty simple. It's just a really nice user experience. And I know Damien from the team who's not, not here today, who works in operations, that also produced a massive decrease in the number of support tickets during the pandemic, as you'd imagine, because for those who want to use self-service, they can just do it instantly. What about you, Sol? There are a lot of new features that are going out, have been going out recently that are really exciting, I think, from both the host side and the customer side of the Skyhook marketplace. I think one that's been asked for many times by our customers and internally is the ability to discover new trips. Say, as our number of trips and hosts on the platform has increased, so has that need Mm. to be able to find the right one to go on as a customer. What we implemented recently, as as we touched upon earlier, was utilizing Algolia, a third-party site search tool to, to provide that functionality for us. Say, 
ordinarily something in the past that may have taken uh, weeks or months to implement, you know, was was done within seven or eight days, fully integrated with lots of capability behind it. I, I was certainly really proud to see go out, and we're starting to get metrics back on that now from customers, showing a, a lot of them using it. And also, we're starting to see areas where we need to make improvements to that from those metrics, where we can add features and functionality, and where we can remove them. It sort of takes me onto a a slightly tangential point actually about third party uh, tooling it's something that we in the last few months have started to use more of you know we we're as developers we often think hey you know i could build that we've got this great thing called serverless that'll take a week to to build a solution to whatever problem it may be and invariably it ends up taking significantly more time to to ship those features and um, so what we started to do given that we're a, a very small team at the moment is to look for third party tooling to give us rapid solutions that we can then you know either they provide a long term solution for us and they're really fully featured and they do what we need without creating too many single points of failure or issues or they can prove they can act as a proof of concept for us is this something that customers really want and should we invest team mm-hmm. time in it because as you mentioned earlier when you've got a small team like this and you've got a, a pandemic going on really prioritization is actually the crucial thing that we've got to get right you know we we've got a list of features as long as our arms that we could work on and we know customers would be asking for but which one is going to provide us with the most business value back and the most satisfaction for our customers so that's an area where we're you know we're turning to these third party tools to, to prove some of these ideas and concepts really quickly and, and reduce those feedback loops that we talked about earlier. Any tools that you would like to mention, Sol? Certainly Algolia on the search is a, is a great tool. I think they're probably the market leader at the moment, and that's been really positive. Our experience was good. Third-party email services, you know, it's, it's very easy to start linking services into AWS SES, simple email service, and, and things like that. But you then find yourself building a lot of your own logic behind it. And actually, it's easier just to outsource mm. to the MailChimps of this world, the Drips or uh, Customer IO or whatever may be your preference. What do you use as a third? So we're using Drip at the moment. So Drip's a specialist e-commerce email marketing tool. Mm-hmm. Our integration is relatively light. It's primarily a front-end integration that we've done so far. We'd like to hook into more of the back-end and some of the events that we fire off as well and that's something we will no doubt do in due course Mm -hmm. but the the key is they're a specialist e-commerce email provider so for us choosing an email provider that offers all of the things that you need when you're essentially selling things on your site is pretty key and and actually a lot of the email services have have gone down that route to try and answer specific more specific customer questions whether they're the perfect one out there time will tell And one of the reasons we still maintain quite a light integration as well, you know, we want to verify that it does everything for us that we need before we, before we dive headfirst in. That's, that's, that's very, very good, Sol. Thank you for that. I have one last question. I think Alan is the one for this. If I've been listening to this for the last 45, 50, 60 minutes, however long it was, and if I, there was one key takeaway from this conversation what would that be, Alan? I think the big technical takeaway, certainly, is that we've really enjoyed working with all these serverless tools, and they've helped us ship code and ultimately great features and experiences to customers much faster. So definitely, if, you, if you're if you a developer and you're looking at some of this stuff and maybe you haven't used it yet, uh, I'd really recommend checking out things like AWS Lambda, AWS EventBridge, or the equivalent tools you know, with the other cloud providers. Yeah, it's, it's really, really useful for improving velocity and ultimately what the customer gets to do with your product. That sounds great. Alan, Sol, and Weecliff, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time and for sharing so many good things with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gav. That's it for this episode of Ship It. 
Thank you for tuning in. We have a bunch of podcasts for developers at Changelog that you should check out. Subscribe to the master feed at changelog.com forward slash master to get everything we ship. I want to personally invite you to join your fellow Changeloggers at changelog.com forward slash community. It's free to join and stay. Leaving, on the other hand, will cost you some happiness credits. Come hang with us on Slack. There are no imposters. Everyone is welcome. Huge thanks again to our partners, Fastly, LaunchDarkly, and Minode. Also, thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder for making all our awesome beats. That's it for this week. See you next week. Thank you.